The lungs of history had contracted. A new breath, out of which new life would evolve, had already begun to fill the researcher's chest. Her diaphragm contracted as she turned, belched, and returned to the task of gathering for the coming era. This book is about a long process of human cultural evolution from circa 30,000 years before the Common Era to the year 2021 and beyond. I argue that along this journey, epigenetics and mutation have been overlooked as essential components within the formation of how humans have come to conceive of themselves within this universe. I posit that epigenetic processes of activation and silencing especially offer templates for cultural, political, and spiritual adaptation in an age of apocalypse. I use the term apocalypse not to insinuate the popularized image of a catalytic, cataclysmic end of times, but in the original Greek meaning of revelation, from apo, an, and kapulin to cover. For almost a century, the fanatic genocidal program of Nazi applied biology has haunted the scientist and the philosopher who would attempt to draw upon biological analogies in their work, and rightly so. Scientific observations do not include ethical guidelines in and of themselves. Today, the decolonial project to unseat white Western cultural imperialism and cultural hegemony, uh, colonial hegemony demonstrates that it is not only biology, but actually any other field of knowledge that can and has in the past been used to justify ideological concepts of racial and cultural supremacy. Colonial projects are always tied to markets, from enslaved persons to palm oil to diamonds, and huge networks of enabling institutions. From the architecture of ancient Greece, stripped of its flamboyant colors during the process of constructing neoclassical whiteness, to the botany and etymology which brought African palm weevils from West Africa to Malaysia, enhancing a new era of enslaved labor in order to create over half of the consumer products in the West. Hello. <clears throat> we would like to welcome everyone to this radio book launch for the new book by Alex Head, Ricochet, Cultural Epigenetics and the Philosophy of Change. This book is available next month, <clears throat> and um, I'm joined here by Annabelle Lacroix and, of course, the author Alex Head. Hello. Um, so we are going to go through some of the issues that are um, that are in this book, and Alex will do some readings from the book, as he just did, which was um, wonderful which is the introduction, which serves as an introduction to this show as well. Um, and so, so let's get the plug out of the way. Um, <clears throat> the publisher is Lia Forlag, is that Le Ja, but Le apparently Jean. when I pronounce it, it sounds French, so let's ah, go, Le with, Jean. go okay, with yours well. if Le you Jean. like. Le Ja. Um, an Oslo publishing house with... Ja, um, with designed by Jon Agard, or John Agard. Um, and once again, this is available at the end of the month from alexhead.com. Uh, but if you're in Scandinavia, please go to lejaforlag.n. Oh. N-O. Okay. <laughs> um, so I've been reading parts of this book, tackling some of the issues. Um, yeah, and um, it does something quite daring, which is to to um, basically draw biological and genetic analogies to culture, which has been somewhat of a taboo in the last hundred odd years, mostly because of Nazism and um, and their you know misuse of uh, such such knowledge. Um, Annabelle. Yes, I think um, it's also interesting to uh, remind um, our listeners that this is Alex's second book, um, and it's been really interesting to me having having a read of the book to also connect um, with Alex's previous book and 
his ways of sort of connecting so many um, aspects of uh, culture, philosophy, and the sciences. Um, his previous book, as you might know, was called Deviant Knowledge. Um, and so I think this new book really expand on what um, knowledge is, but also what it can do and how, as we um, humans um, connect with this idea of knowledge in many ways, not in the way that we often think about it as something sort of academic or inaccessible or something that's kind of um, inside the kind of inaccessible libraries. But I think Alex, and as, as an artist, brings this very um, open and um, accessible uh, view onto like really urgent issues, um, as he uh, mentioned in the in the introduction. Thank so you. I think it's some also of the complexity that is in there is from that that point of view, which is come also from an artist's practice. Yeah, it's very so lived. Maybe you you know we'll get into some of mm. that. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think it it proceeds quite carefully um, because in order to um, to use this the, use these sciences as analogies, one must first actually grapple with what they actually are. Um, so I guess this is. Um, and this is something that the book does does very carefully. So I guess it's time to hand back to Alex um, to actually intro some of the, the scientific issues that the book deals with. Yeah, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to read a bit more. Um, this is from chapter one. Um, I wanted first to talk about biological process of cha processes of change uh, and then the possibility of cultural models and their application through comparative cultural anthropology. Uh, this is difficult to do without diagrams, which is why I wrote the book, but perhaps we can explore some of the central themes here. Um, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I think what we're talking about here very much is, is, tied, up, is tied up with Darwin's observations about variation and selection, and there is, of course, a coherence with radio and what we're doing right now, what we're doing today, um, where we have a curatorial process which looks through many different types of sound making um, and then kind of brings that into a particular form. Um, but to stick with the science for a minute, the development and function of an organism is largely controlled by its genes. Genes are selected sections of an organism's full DNA sequence, known as the genome. All cells reproduce by making copies of themselves. They self-replicate in an ongoing process that requires sustenance, energy, and nutrition. During this process, a cell divides creating two versions of itself, making a copy of the genetic material within that cell. Sometimes the process of replication incurs errors or deviations in the transcriptions of the genetic code, and these are known as mutations. But changes in cells as they replicate can also be caused by external factors, as well as changes to the programming within the organism's cells themselves. There are then a number of different ways in which a cell can create versions of itself with novel characteristics. Two significant modes of change occur when a cell replicates. One involves epigenetics and the other mutation. Epigenetic changes can be brought on by a series of chemical tags which sit on top of epi, a chain of wound up DNA called histones, which determine the way the genes are read. The other form of developmental change I want to draw upon is mutation. Strictly speaking, mutation only occurs at the level of the genome. Mutation in organic life, plant or human, is an alteration to the hardware, the DNA of the organism. Whereas epigenetically triggered development is equivalent to the software running in a replicating organism. When a cell divides and replicates, a new cell is called the daughter cell. Fidelity to or variation away from the mother cell is determined by which genes are turned on or off, expressed in the manifestation of the new daughter cell. A key example is the seasonally flowering plant Arodopsis thaliana, or thalecress. The study of thalecress has received that has revealed that certain species require periods of extreme cold before 
flowering again when conditions are suitable. Once the genome of the cress has been cloned out, it became apparent that the way in which the plant was able to flower at the right time each year was through epigenetic regulation. As with all living organisms, the genetic information of a plant such as thalecress is carried by the chromosomes in its cells. As the cell replicates, the histones and their accompanying chemical tags, the epigenome, determine the way in which the DNA is interpreted and therefore what kind of protein and therefore what kind of character the new cell will have. In this case, the genes which are targeted by the triggers for flowering, for example warmth and sunlight, are blocked and silenced by the epigenome. So, to me, epigenetic processes are about frequency and patterns, whereas mutation is about novelty and experimentation. The reason this is really interesting to me is that these processes of biological change occur over very different timescales, with epigenetic change happening within our, own within our own lifetimes, where mutations can take thousands of years to manifest visible or phenotopically within animals. So I've jumped into the science there. Um, I think that the main um, things to keep in mind, perhaps, is this idea of epigenetic regulation, patterns, frequencies, things coming round again, as it were, um, versus, as it were, novelty, mutation, the idea that something is uh, divergent from what's existed prior. Um, if we want to talk a little bit about the science, perhaps also for the listener, maybe now is the time um, to elaborate on that a bit before perhaps looking at how some of these analogies work within the book for cultural and anthropology. And what were your uh, readings of that science? What's your understanding of epigenetics? It's still a relatively new field. Um, I, um, I have a question, and maybe the question is, is, comes from a place of misunderstanding. So <clears throat> you've characterized the um, epigenome as both something that can uh, change within the individual's life, but also being characterized by um, phasing and frequency and patterns. Yeah. Um, whereas you've characterized the uh, DNA as something that's sort of uh, full of mutation and uh, novelty, but this is unchanging uh, between the between the um, between. Uh, so is that correct? Um, well, no. I'm, what I'm I'm characterizing mutation in terms of deviation and. Um, adaptation on mm. what has been inherited yeah mm -hmm. um so for example i mean both can occur through exposure to uh, physical phenomena so if you're exposed to radiation you can get mutations within your cells right this is right. coming from the yeah. dna whereas with epigenetics it's more that you have a certain um liability or a certain a higher chance a tendency. A tendency, for example, yeah, exactly, um, to develop in certain ways. So the analogy with, uh, well, it's not really an analogy, the, the example um, of, of Thalecress is highlighting, for example, the way in which it's necessary for the plant to have that cycle, it's necessary for it to have that rhythm, um, and, that it, you, and that the epigenome is actually operating in accordance with its environment to reproduce that cycle of flowering. Mm. Um, and and dormancy and so these histomes and the sort of tags that they form um, how recent is this the understanding of it yeah how so I th discovery so it, it first became apparent I think in the kind of 1940s and it mm. was kind of theorized about and then within the 1970s with the kind of mass computerization of the scientific world and, and a lot of other worlds um, information technology um, then they started to once they, they once they had mapped the genome, for example, it was much easier to start looking for patterns and to try and understand um, the correlation between DNA genes um, and uh, the patterns which they saw within nature. And the reason why they chose, or the reason why uh, Thalecress has become particularly popular as a model for this, is because it has a very short genome and it, it operates on a very fast cycle. So it was easier. For them to identify uh, how these how these how these patterns were occurring, mm, what was mm. actually causing them, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's still very young in terms of its like cultural 
interpretation, let's say. And um, there is a paper called Cultural Epigenetics um, by Eva Jablonka, who's done a lot of great work um, with her partner, um, Marion Lam, to kind of popularize, if you like, the idea of epigenetics and to take it as a, as a more serious field than it is. Um, partly because it it kind of goes against, I mean, it appears to go against Darwinian logic of kind of like adaptation and survival and so on. Um, and it sort of brings back this kind of Lamarckian idea that, you know, everything is inherited and that there's, there's no way and that, uh, which of course he was sort of disproven by Darwin. But I think what they're arguing for and in my own way, perhaps through a cultural register, um, is that actually it's, it's a combination of both. So there are inherited tendencies, but there is also plasticity within your lifetime. There is also the capacity um, to be altered and, and potentially to alter, I would argue, uh, your own epigenome um, through a good diet, through not being exposed to pollution, through these kinds of things. Good luck to uh, contemporary humans with that, that particular task. Yes. <laughs> so maybe I can... Um, ask you in terms of epigenetics um, if I understand the idea which you um, kind of develop around this cultural epigenetic is how the environment like the environment or the, the milieu is basically um, allow a particular expression of, um, of that genome so in that sense this environment becomes like this cult a cultural expression. Um, and yeah, I wonder um, um, how do we see this in terms of our own position culturally as like, okay, maybe, I don't know, uh, do scientists in um, different parts of the world have different views on how that functions or is it is it mostly that something that's being developed like as a Western idea or um, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I don't think that it's any more it's, uh, super tied up with, for example, like uh, a Western scientific institution. I mean, epigenetics is taken seriously by all si serious scientists and, and biologists around the world, for sure. How it reaches a kind of cultural register remains to be seen, I, I would say. Um, there is definitely a kind of a political aspect to how you apply those observations. Um, I guess, in a way, um, yeah, I mean, there, there is a short, so there's a short piece I also wanted to con kind of contribute to this. So these two biological processes, epigenetic and mutation, uh, lay the groundwork for the way in which I have approached the task of comparative anthropology. Uh, they ask, is this new or is this just the same ideas that have existed, existed since the dawn of recorded history? Um, in this sense, the biological is used to assess processes of cultural imperialism and hegemony. In other words, power. Why are things the way they are? Um, and my subject for this comparative work is the sacred date palm tree. Um, which, while ever present in, you know, my own Western Greek uh, canonized day-to-day -day cultural life, in the form of classical architecture, is actually grounded in the Fertile Crescent uh, some twelve thousand years ago. So, when I started this research, I was actually more interested in plants, and I was really looking at the idea of plant consciousness. And I had also begun to investigate um, the floral motifs on classical architecture, particularly in the Corinthian column. So it was a kind of bed bug of mine, like, why do they have plants? Is this just the Garden of Eden? Is it a Garden of Paradise kind of archetype, which has just followed through? And that was very much kind of a curiosity. And then as I pushed further and further back into the historical record and then into this kind of archaeological record because it it starts just to become less and less information um, as, as you travel through time. What I kind of arrived at was this motif of the sacred palm tree which actually um, 
foregrounds and, and is very much directly connected to this Greek architecture. So while we are given the official narrative of uh, this sculpture Callimachus in, in Corinth in 500 before the Common Era, kind of, you know, happening upon this um, funeral basket for this young woman, and then the uh, acanthus grew through it, and, you know, it was this kind of inspirational artist moment. I mean, we're given this account by Vitruvius, who has also made other sort of dubious claims, but um, that's kind of the epistem for that particular piece of architecture. And actually, when you look at it in more detail, you start to see that there is a palm, there is a palm leaf. Um, there are things going on with uh, Greek mythology, which are sort of not included in that, um, to do with acanthus, and this is a whole other kind of erased female narrative within this architecture as well. Um, so I was really trying to look at like the Garden of Paradise and sort of like bring that into um, a sort of historical timeline. But actually what I found was something which was not so much a garden, but more of a tree. And then, and then I also kind of identified, you know, I mean, I'm not an archaeologist, but like I could see within the record that there are these patterns of use of this palm tree. And yet, of course, there are many, many different variations along that timeline. There are many mutations, if you like, on the form. There are many different expressions. Of course, it means many different things to many people. But it has a deeply religious meaning, and it has a deeply kind of spiritual meaning and mystical meaning. And I wonder to what extent that's available within the classical architecture of today. So that's how, it, for me, it kind of intersects as well with the idea of the question of power and the question of, because it's very much these powerful colonial institutions which have kind of placed this architecture all around the world and drawn such strength from it as a symbol of democracy you know um yeah so so those two kind of dynamics actually t they have actually played out uh it's say in a useful way um in terms of like comparing and, and sort of trying to think about like are we just in this kind of you know slow cancellation of the future um or are we kind of still at the foreground of something new is there something new happening is something new still possible i think yeah that kind of feels <laughs> um maybe part of the moment that we're in a little bit too you know with restrictions and so on but um um so one thing that i picked up on um from this was this idea of plant consciousness and it occurs to me that <clears throat> We, we might never know the answer to what extent a plant is or isn't conscious. Maybe our consciousnesses are too different, but the idea of plants acting with intent is is certainly um, becoming much more uh, palatable to people. And the the one idea that I've encountered is that, that um, plants like dates... Uh, hmm. Tomatoes, for instance, have selected humans as their uh, means of um, distribution, mm. their means of um, of propagating. We are the propagators of of these plants, and have been for a very long time. And we've co-evolved with dates and tomatoes. I mean, tomatoes. So are many the, tomatoes. Tomatoes are the uh, you say. You literally say tomato. I literally say tomato. Um, but the but tomatoes do this. They they co-evolved with us, and they do some some very interesting things. Their uh, their seeds can survive the human digestive tract. One of the few plants that grow well in human poo. Mm. They um, and they they turn red when they're ready for us to do this. They send us a signal and. Uh, in turn, plants, high yield plants like tomatoes and dates, have allowed humans to breed into greater numbers to take the tomato to places where it never grew before. It's from the New World. It's now grown, you know, all throughout Southern Europe, the whole world. Um, and so, if we're talking about genetics and selection and mm. engineering, we might. Uh, flip the usual relationship and imagine that we're being bioengineered by plants and to bring it back to your date uh, recurring date uh, kind of theme dates may well be one of these 
plants as well. They certainly are a very high yield plant. Um, they've certainly been uh, carried to a lot of new places by us. I'm not sure about the precise history where they come from in the world, but um, certainly they're a plant that has uh, allowed us to to become the world dominating, world spanning species that we are, and therefore is probably quite a worthy um, subject of worship, just as God uh, supposedly, or let's just say he did, or they did, created humans. Plants created us. They allowed us, if not created us, but allowed us to, to reach the scale that we have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like that as well because I think it can kind of transition a little bit um, into this idea of the echo, in this idea of broadcasting, right? So you're broadcasting seeds, so the, the plant itself is kind of replicating itself as it travels through space and, of course, through culture as well. Um, you have, for example, Mohammed who said, you know, like, um, they who have been fasting shall break their fast by eating dates, you know, and so these very, very strong religious, religious experiences um, encountered through fasting and meditating and, and only eating dates um, in the wilderness is, is, is one of the uh, one of the stories of Muhammad. Um, but what I wanted to do now to kind of like break a little bit the format of the book launch <laughs> um, is to is to is to play some sounds um, for for a short while and to come back to this idea of of the garden um, thereafter. P, fire, shot, hit the wall, then it should bounce. And this is where we're making a ricochet sound. And we want it to bounce a specific set of numbers uh, until it... So in my case, I'm using it should bounce. You can also add, which I've done in my case, bounce, angle, effects, frequency. You can also play around with these settings. Is in front bool from my previous tutorial and replace it with number of bounces because when we're using Ricochets, we're actually calculating bounces, so we're actually setting a condition based on the bounces when we should play P, fire, shot, hit the wall, then it should bounce. And this is where we're making a ricochet sound. And we want it to bounce a specific set of numbers uh, until it... So in my case, I'm using it should bounce. You can also add, which I've done in my case, bounce, angle, effects, frequency. You can also play around with these settings. It's in front bool from my previous tutorial and replace it with number of bounces because... When we're using ricochets, we're actually calculating bounces, so we're actually setting a condition based on the bounces when we should play P, fire, shot, hit the wall, then it should bounce. And this is where we're making a ricochet sound. Thank you. 
it's quite of, uh, in the same time funny and paradoxical because at the same time that the women were reclaiming the gender, the flesh, the body behind the authors and reclaiming they were female painters, they were fem female filmmakers, um, they were um, female uh, writers in 68 and 69 were the big and famous and mythical text by Bach, the death of the author and Foucault, what is an author and both were reclaiming the death of the author in, um, for the good of the birth of the reader so at one, one side it goes with what the feminist was expecting meaning to, to kill the author and to get rid of this uh, patriarchal figure of the genius, the male author at the same time it was uh, destroying what uh, the location we, the feminists will need occupy and act as the author were the location so it was this kind of twist in time I think it's kind of funny when we claim to be an author finally when he died it proved that the women of feminists they were always on too late in a way when they reclaimed the author well it's not on fashion anymore it's a, it's, a, it's like okay you cannot reclaim I mean you're too late you are old fashioned and so that meaning that the, the women are chasing the figure of the author for centuries because before it was God and then it was biology, you know, the man problem of his own work, and then it was uh, the um, existentialist and uh, the conceptual author, and then it was something else, and then it was something else, so they are chasing the figure of the author, they are always behind, but the same way for realistically, I think it's nice that uh, we as, if we say we feminists, or if we say we are women now, we will never get the, this place, we will never catch it. I mean, we never got the, the, the right location. I think this is nice. This, this always displacing, 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 always chasing, always displacing, 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 always
of Greek mythology. Um, she does not exist in the official library, which contains something like over a million Greek terms, um, but she does exist in important other um, anthologies. And it is said that he approached her um, uh, with lust, and she denied him, um, scratched his face, and in return was metamorphosized into the acanthus plant, which would also explain the acanthus leaves with their spiky um, kind of foliage, uh, which exist, uh, which are sort of absolutely fundamental to the Corinthian uh, level of the Corinthian order altogether. Um, this also sort of brings me back a little bit to the problem of the female experience within history and its representation and its uh, silencing, let's say, in epigenetic terms, um, because one cannot really compose a narrative of the Garden of Paradise without getting into the idea of mother goddesses, um, of goddesses as the sort of first, the very first, uh, the oldest human sculptures and artifacts which we begin to find in the historical record around 30,000 BCE and which range from Siberia all the way down um, through the Mediterranean. Um, so I thought maybe we could discuss a little bit about like how this is the case or what, what is there anything that can be done about this? Is it possible to rehabilitate um, these important uh, female experiences and therefore cultural artifacts as they travel through history because um, it is, of course, a cliche to say that it is written by men, uh, but nonetheless, it, it also is apparent within the emergence of, of the agricultural world um, that the female goddess became subsumed by the male god. The male god only emerges very late uh, within the anthropological record. Um, how might that speak to contemporary <laughs> narratives, my dear guests? Slash hosts. Um, no small question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in this, uh, on this radio. Um, well, you know, I really, I mean, we all hope that you're right, because otherwise, I don't know where we'll go. <laughs> but, um, I mean, for me, I, I, I was just re, you know, thinking about the different aspects of um, of feminism that you bring in the book. It's really, it, remind, it reminded me of this... Um, this memory that I have from studying uh, anthropology at university, um, which was a minor, I was doing art history, and so I was kind of there just as, like for curiosity, and I found it astonishing to to discover through actually studying at uni that a lot of the big theories um, in anthropology, some of those you mentioned in the book, are based on so little... Uh, evidence and mm. the my whole the, the whole class was basically based about like this man this man this man went there did that and then well we don't have much evidence but this is what they think um how human evolution should be um and then but nowadays there's been like some kind of nuance to say to have to, to recognize that actually we don't know. We don't, you know. We we make all these assumptions from like some skeleton found here or, or here, and as we advance with discoveries, then we find a new skeleton that's older than the previous one, and then the whole theory changes again. Um, and at the time, I remember um, that the Darwinist um, evolutionary idea was uh, was started only kind of started to be questioned, and there was this projection of um, the, the kind of evolution um, drawing where you like it's like one branch and things kind of like branch off from the main branch and this kind of linear evolution like this and then the teacher said well actually now we're realizing that um, we have much more in common with like this ancient um, organism for example which really shows that this straight evolution like is you know questions, <laughs> mm. and so I think the the real question is um, the change of if if we really want to change paradigm, um, then I think what ecofeminism brings is really 
uh, kind of a new relation. So I think what epigenetic is, from what I understand what you say in the book, is a different uh, way, uh, it's a different theory because it, it instead of um, thinking things as one thing linked to another, it's actually things are relations. Everything is a relationship between things. And that's what ecofeminism is kind of to bring, is like instead of a straight line with branches, it's um, mm. a kind of, we, we could see it as like a circular type model with relationships between things. Um, and so to me, that is the ma- that this is the major kind of change of, of, of point of view that, that epigenetics maybe, I'm not, if I understand correctly, is bringing. And that is very exciting. And I think it doesn't have to be necessarily about male or female. You know, it's a, it's a different, it's just a, a different way of, of seeing it all together. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think that, um, yeah, certainly if we're looking at plants to understand the changes which are going on around us and the kind of encroachment of the natural world upon our our own kind of, you know, human-made and, and, and you could say sort of, to some extent, artificial um, blip in the historical timeline, um, then, yeah, then I think it's interesting to try and work out, well, what have been... Um, what is the wealth of history about the idea of change itself in relationship to the, 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 the organic, as it were, and obviously we're organic as well, but in terms of the plant kingdom, um, all of that kind of terminology reeking of, of patriarchy in itself, right? Kingdom, mankind. Um, but just as, an, as a sort of lead, a follow-on from what you were saying, there is um, this very interesting article um, by Virginia Hughes in the National Geographic who actually postulates that uh, you know, this kind of uh, the figure of the archetypal sort of wizard in the cave, you know, these early cave drawings are actually um, three quarters of those handprints are, uh, she would argue, and many other anthrop- anthropologists and scientists would argue, are female hands. So it's actually from, you know, and like you say, once you start the story that it's the man in the cave, then you get all these other men, you know, you can take it all the way up to Crowley, Zarathustra, all these other wizard men, Gandalf, whoever you've inherited as your archetypal idea of, of, of who this male wizard is. And it, and it completely changes that. And I think we're in a place now with, um, yeah, the, the, the interface of different knowledges and sciences where we can start to get a different picture of all of that, as you, as you so eloquently described. Um, yeah, it's... Um it's kind of humbling to realize how little we know. Um, also, you know, in the continuing kind of uh, debates over the precise mechanisms of evolution, though I would say evolution is a very uh, elegant theory for explaining how things are. There's a lot of talk of um, horizontal gene transfer. Uh, I, hate, I don't want to mm. say the V word, but viruses can actually... Uh, transferred genes between different humans and this is a very kind of it's very debatable how st- uh, we have a lot of genes but when we had a lot less when we were just growing up from little worms maybe horizontal gene transfer did a lot of things for us you know um, mm. also uh, all of this focus on origins um seems to me to be a quest for not we're not so as interested in um where we come from and how we got here as the idea that these answering these questions might give us an answer to what we should do and how things should be and um as we kind of enter a, an era of you know un extremely unparalleled especially in an environmental context we will be probably forced to uh do things that are completely unnatural to the world to stay alive Mm. and as we enter an era of geoengineering annabelle's point of understanding how little evidence we have and how little we actually know is going to be it's going to be quite uh important and it's going to be become very scary 
Yeah, and I and I do feel that it's going to rush up at us very quickly um, at precisely the point where it becomes impossible to have any kind of. Um, I mean, we're not. To, we're not. I'm, I'm certainly not trying to find a central single narrative, right? That's completely contrary. But at the same time, a sense of eye level communication and and the ability to, um, at least within one's kind of like. Uh, immediate environment and I do always try and bring this kind of work back to a question of what do you do when you speak to the people in the square mile living around you you know where how can this stuff resonate for those people and that's why I also kind of try to ground it in the architecture itself because everyone has whether they like it or not an experience of classical architecture and and when you start looking uh, for these sacred palm leaves you really do see them on a daily basis you see them in carpets you see them in sofas you see them in balustrades you see them you know they really penetrate the culture and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing I just think that's really interesting like your example with the tomatoes you know how is it that these forms get there get us to replicate them over and over which is, is also another thing it's another part of humans learning to be a bit more humble about their position in the whole thing um yeah it's it's been fascinating it's been lovely to to speak with you both and I think that in my own uh, sort of listening experience of, of, of many of the shows that we've done and many of the other things which have, which we've all been listening to, um, it's knowing when to uh, stop, and it's knowing when <laughs> to take that kind of moment oh, no. and say the things which have happened are important. If you can reflect on these, we do not need to uh, try and resolve the issues in the book. We do not need to try and cover cover the eight chapters of the book uh, in a, in a one hour radio show. But I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> but you just on the tip of my tongue. I'm j- I was just about no, but maybe next week. Maybe next yes, week we'll have week. to. No, yeah. come on. We have to ask this question. Uh, which is what is the answer? No, no, no. Yeah, no. What is to be done? The oh, Lenin. No, 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 no. That's not the question. That's that is the that is the only question. But the uh, the less pressing question is, Annabelle. No, I, I just wanted to. Um, to know like where does the ricochet comes in the picture mm-hmm. oh i mean we were try- we were just getting there that's why i was like I yes see. this is my it, you know you were so yes it's a ricochet it's a ricochet yeah and and even though i promised myself i'm not going to do it <laughs> um yeah i mean it, you know it's there's so many aspects of that which for me work within the book and again it's about frequencies and patterns and returning back to these questions so it has these in a sense each chapter is an attempt to build on answers towards these questions um i think in the end you've already highlighted a great deal of it which is to do with um the necessity to see oneself and one's situation as contingent we have to come to understand that we are deeply embedded within these different systems we're deeply embedded within different belief systems as well um, and we're deeply embedded, certainly from a white male Western perspective, in the kind of colonial histories which have produced a lot of this knowledge. Um, so, yeah, that idea of ricochet is also to do with sound. It's also to do with uh, the radio practice. There is chapter seven is um, the radio master and the cultural forager. I'm kind of framing you guys as cultural foragers. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm exactly. always and hungry. Bringing things in and, and sort of testing them. Grazers. And, you know. And putting them to the test. So, yeah, let's 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 have some a little more sound, perhaps, yes. know, as a way to deal with the idea of ricochet. And and I will try and squeeze in my thank yous in the last three minutes. Let's see if we get as far as that.
So tired of dark So tired 